much for that very um, uh, generous introduction. Uh, it's a great pleasure, indeed an honour, to be here today to take part in this very important conference. It's also a pleasure to follow my colleague and friend, Wayne David MP, who's of a different political persuasion to me. I don't know what it is about uh, Strasbourg vis-à-vis -vis, uh, John Hume and uh, others, but uh, I agreed with 90% plus of what he had to say, uh, and I'm pleased to say that. It doesn't happen that often, but uh, it's nice once in a while. It doesn't do him any credit. I'm sure that doesn't help me either, but still. Uh, in terms of back... Oh, fine. It, well, it's rather public not to tell anybody, actually. Um, in terms of background, I'm a member of the House of Commons Justice Committee uh, and uh, also a barris barrister with several years' experience dealing with vulnerable women who are victims of domestic violence and other forms of abuse. In the year 2000 to 2011 to 12, I led an inquiry in the UK Parliament which succeeded in changing the law on stalking. And I'm currently fight fighting for a review of the law covering domestic violence in the UK. My principal experience in this field then is evidently rooted uh, in my UK experience. But as delegates will be all too aware, violence against women is a global pandemic. Indeed, I think that phrase was used earlier today. On average, at least one in three women globally is beaten, coerced into sex, or abused in some other way by an intimate partner during the course of her lifetime. One in five women will become a victim of rape or attempted rape at some point in her life. And horrifically, women aged between 15 and 45 are more at risk from domestic violence and rape than from cancer, war, traffic accidents or malaria. It's estimated that upwards of 125 million women and girls uh, who are alive today have been subject to the brutal practice of female genital mutilation. And most victims of FGM are young girls between infancy and age 15. And in half of the countries where this abominable practice occurs, the majority of girls uh, were cut before they reached even the age of five. UNICEF estimates that over 90% of women and girls between the ages of 15 and 49 in Somalia, Guinea, Djibouti and Egypt have undergone this treatment. Moreover, the International Centre for Research on Women estimates that there are around 70 million child brides worldwide. Astonishingly, the UN Office for the High Commission uh, of Human Rights estimates that in the developing world, one in seven girls are married before their 15th birthday. Violence against women is an issue which should galvanise every country. It's a fight which is sadly far from being over. In 1792, Mary uh, Wollstonecraft published her manifesto entitled A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, in which she argued, and I quote, I do not wish women to have power over men, but over themselves. Well, that was in 1792, 220 years uh, later plus. How many countries across the world can truly boast that women in their societies have proper rights or power over their own future and well-being. The fact that sexual violence, FGM and forced marriage are still commonplace in so many parts of the world surely is testament to the fact that the fight for women's rights continues. But that, that's not to say that work is not being done to tackle these practices. In June of this year, the UK will host the Global Summit to End Sexual Violence in Conflict, which will be chaired by the Foreign Secretary and I believe Angelina Jolie in her capacity of a special envoy uh, for the UN High Commission for Refugees. This summit will be, it is hoped, the most extensive of its kind ever, and delegates will uh, meet to find concord in four areas in principle. One, how to improve investigations of sexual violence in conflict. Two, how to provide greater support and assistance and reparation for survivors including child survivors of sexual violence. Three, how to ensure that responses to sexual and gender-based violence uh, are fully integrated in all peace and security efforts. And fourthly, how to improve international strategic coordination. Conference, it should be a blight on the conscience of the world that sexual violence is still being used as a weapon in conflict. 
Already two-thirds of all members of the United Nations have endorsed the Declaration of Commitment to end sexual violence in conflict. The international community has an obligation to lobby other members to ratify it. I have already mentioned the shocking number of victims of F FGM who are concentrated in African countries and the Middle East. Yet this problem exists closer to home uh, too. Although uh, it has been against the law in England and Wales since 1985, there has yet to be a single conviction for this horrendous practice. And it is estimated that more than 66,000 women and girls in England and Wales have already got, undergone this practice, and that 24,000 girls under 15 are currently at risk. But I am pleased to say that from April of this year, there will be an obligation on national health hospitals to record information on whether FGM-related procedures have been carried out on their patients. This information will be reported centrally to the Department of Health on a monthly basis. On the 6th of February this year, uh, the UK Home Office launched a new initiative on this uh, uh, issue, uh, having been given funding from the European Commission. So work is being done at grassroots level. In March of this year, the UK Government passed a law which will finally criminalise forced marriages in the UK. And forced marriages are endemic of violence against women and, of course, men. Delegates will uh, not need me to tell them that the pressure put on young people to marry against their will can be psychological, emotional and even financial, as well as being physical. These many forms of violence is a point to which I will return shortly. Forced marriages are especially a problem in the UK, especially since they are often hidden from view. In 2005, the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and the Home Office jointly established a forced marriage unit which operates within the UK as well as overseas via consulates. Between January and December of 2013, this unit provided advice and support in 1,302 cases involving 74 different countries of origin, including Pakistan representing 42 0.7%, India 10.9%, Bangladesh 9.8%, Afghanistan 2.8%, and so on. 97%, 97 sorry, of these cases centred on victims with disabilities. Where the age was known, 15% of these cases involved victims who were younger than 16 years of age. The victim, uh, uh, victims who were over 30, uh, there were only 3% of these clearly showing that children are at, are at hugely greater risk. Considering the great number of countries of origin involved in these cases, an international approach is necessary. Countries must work together and find accord to tackle this issue. Forced marriage should not be acceptable in any culture or country. I have spoken a little now about the need for countries to work together to protect and uphold the human rights of all citizens. This may, of course, seem ironic as I stand here as a member of the UK Parliament where debates are raging about whether to leave the European Union and disassociate ourselves from the European Court of Human Rights. And as Wayne said, um, the UK after all has no codified constitution. The rights of the citizens of the UK are not officially recorded in this way. So it may come as something of a shock to you to hear that I am fiercely opposed to the UK withdrawing from the EU and from the ECHR. Given that a vociferous minority of Europhobes in the UK Parliament seems to drown out more reasonable views, uh, I am an internationalist and I believe very firmly that these rights must be codified in order to be protected. And I also believe that rights must have a basis at home. As I set out earlier, being a member of the House of Commons Justice Committee in the UK Parliament. This is tasked with holding the Justice Department and the Secretary of State himself to account. We scrutinise legislation before it is debated in Parliament and we hold inquiries into how well the Government's policies are being put into practice. We are consultees on sentencing policy and guidelines and we also interview candidates for various high-profile 
justice jobs. One of our recent inquiries was into women in the penal system, a topic which some delegates may wish to return to during questions, possibly. I also chair a parliamentary group which meets with representatives of justice trade unions every two months or so, as well as an offshoot group which specifically meets to discuss issues relating to family and children courts. So I do have a deep interest in the rights of victims of crime and in fi finding better ways to deal with reparation for the violence perpetrated against them. In 2011-12, I said, I had the privilege of chairing an independent parliamentary inquiry into reforming the law on stalking uh, after I became aware of the limitations of the legislation which was then in place to protect victims of stalking. It was the Protection from Harassment Act 1997. And I also became aware that on average between six and eight women are killed by stalkers every, every year in the United Kingdom and thousands of lives are ruined by it. I should add at this point that although roughly 80% of reported stalking cases in the UK involve a female victim, it is not exclusively a female problem, of course. But the experience of chairing this inquiry really brought it home to me that women's rights to safety and protection are being thwarted in the UK every day. Although the original legislation had been drafted with stalking in mind, our inquiry found that the conviction rates were very low and that actually only 2% of those convicted of stalking were in any event jailed. One of the principal flaws in the legislation was that stalking was not named in legislation. So we looked at other legislation covering stalking across the world and found that legislation criminalising this behaviour could be found in English-speaking countries, including the US, Australia and New Zealand, as well as in 13 EU member states. Most of these countries introduced legislation in the 1990s, although Denmark was an anomaly in this instance, since it had included the crime of stalking in its penal code since 1933, astonishingly. Uh, not, that's not meant to be rude to Denmark, just to say they were way ahead of the game. Um, it was, however, perplexing that stalking uh, as such was not named as a specific offence in any of these countries, apart from Scotland, which introduced its own off offence in 2010. And in a, a report published by the Moderna Group on Stalking for the EU Commission in 2007, academic experts made the case that choosing not to define stalking in legislation often resulted in uh, legal confusion and that as a result, the concept of stalking is not well integrated among the various professions within the criminal justice system in those countries. So our inquiry decided that naming stalking was essential if criminal justice professionals were to understand the nuances of the crime. And so criminalising stalking specifically was one of our four principal recommendations. In February 2012, we published a report with recommendations on how legislation and practices should be improved. Within a month of our report's publication, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, announced that the government would be acting imminently to implement our main recommendations. And new clauses were passed by both Houses of Parliament in 11 days. I don't know how it is in other countries, but changing the law in the UK is very rarely that fast. A student from the University of Toronto is even writing it up in her PhD thesis on all party groups in Commonwealth legislatures. She even flew over to London for an interview. My goodness. I made the point earlier when discussing forced marriages that violence is not always physical. Similarly, in this context, it was of the utmost importance to us as a panel uh, for the new law to take note of the fact that threats to safety um, uh, to those suffering from stalking are not always exclusively physical. So the new law is split into two sections which has been added to the Protection from Harassment Act, namely a Section 2A offence punishable by up to 51 weeks in prison or a fine, but also, also a harsher 4A offence which involves stalking which prompts fear of violence or serious alarm or distress. This latter offence is punishable by up to five years imprisonment or a fine or both. 
The Oxford English Dictionary, after all, defines violence as including forcibly interfering with personal freedom. And it is this last point, forcibly interfering with personal freedom, where stalking can be considered an example of violence. During one of our early evidence sessions, the horrific reality of the crime uh, was brought home quite starkly to us by someone using the phrase, stalking is mental rape. And I'm pleased to say that 18 months after the law uh, became, uh, uh, was, um, became uh, 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 active, there are 600 or so cases before the UK courts. About 150 of them, the more serious 4A offence, and the rest of them making up 600 of the, the other two, uh, Section 2 offence. So I, I sincerely hope that by doing that we have saved many lives and we have uh, prevented many other lives from being absolutely ruined by this awful offence. But stalking is uh, not the only type of violence that women in the UK face. Indeed, again, involvement in this campaign led in due course to my introducing a 10-minute rule bill in the UK Parliament which would criminalise all aspects of domestic violence since, rather unbelievably, not all types of domestic violence are currently uh, criminal offences in the UK. And I should point out that the UK government's cross-governmental definition of domestic violence is and has been since 2013, and I quote, any incident or pattern of incidents of controlling, coercive, threatening behaviour, violence or abuse between those aged 16 or over who are or have been intimate partners or family members regardless of gender or sexuality. The abuse can encompass but is not limited to psychological, physical, sexual, financial and emotional abuse. This definition of course is not legal uh, and not all of these behaviours are criminal offences. This means that there are gaps in the law whereby perpetrators can abuse their partners without being able to be arrested for that behaviour. The main gap is probably that coercive control is not an offence. This can include financial and psychological control and can be a pattern of, quote, acts of assaults, threats, humiliation and intimidation. My bill would give this definition statutory footing. It passed its first reading with cross-party support at the end of February and the second reading is scheduled to take place in June. And I do hope the government will uh, take its recommendations on board and will act accordingly, as I believe the victims of this crime uh, deserve nothing less. But with the advent of social media and the fact that now that so much of our lives are conducted online, the rise of online abuse is a worrying phenomenon which is unlikely to go away with time. Tackling online abuse is made especially difficult due to the relatively easy means of registering servers abroad, which means that prosecuting uh, any individual can be extremely difficult. The prevalence of anonymity on the internet also facilitates illegal activity in this regard. If we are to counter the problem of the territorial extent of our laws, the international community must sooner or later unite in tackling online abuse. It is no longer permissible to simply say that a victim should, quote, keep off the internet, unquote. In summary then, the rights of women to safety and to a life free from fear, distress and physical danger are not being given due priority in countries around the world, including the UK. And if we are to tackle violence against women, we must appreciate that it can take many forms. In many instances, tackling attitudes is as important almost as fighting practices. It is an issue which transcends borders, race and also culture. We should show no tolerance in tackling and erasing it from our societies. But tackling violence against women begins at home. That is why I'm proud to have played my part in securing this robust stalking legislation in the UK and why I'm now keen to gain redress for all victims of domestic violence. And in some areas, including cyber abuse and forced marriages, cross-border cross -border cooperation between different countries is essential be it on a European or a pan-European or a further international uh, basis, it's essential to uh, secure proper investigation and convictions. Violence against women and girls is regrettably a deep-rooted problem 
which too many people uh, are still uh, viewing as a reality of everyday life. Across the world, women are abused and manipulated. Uh, we must lend a voice to these women and girls to ensure that our justice systems are there to protect them and to engender their confidence. They deserve no less and that they should have, in Mary Wollstonecraft's words, power over themselves. Thank you very much. Thank you.